We're ready. Okay. All right, this is an interview at the New York State Military Museum, Saratoga Springs, New York. It is the 19th of October 2005, approximately 11 a.m. Interviewers are Wayne Clark and Mike Russert. Could you give me your full name, date of birth, and place of birth, please? Uh, name is Howard W. Snyder. Uh, I live in Hamilton, New York. Were you born in Hamilton? Born in okay. Hamilton. <laughs> we used to get a body of I was born in the uh, Burger King's parking lot. But actually, it was a, a private home at that time before they tore it down. And I've lived in Hamilton for now just over 80 years. Mm -hmm. okay. I was born uh, September 13, 1925. All right. Um, what was your educational background prior to entering service? <laughs> because it, it's very interesting. Uh, Got to high school and I left the high school in junior year to go in the Marines, and uh, that was in '43. And uh, I was supposed to graduate in '44, and I put uh, uh, the 30 months, two and a half years in the in the Marine Corps. Came back and before I even got out of uniform on my 30-day rehabilitation leave, I went back. Started my junior year, and that was in March of uh, '46, and I graduated in '47 after getting out of the Marine Corps in '46. Okay. Then I worked two years, and then I went to business school for two years on the GI Bill of Rights. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, do you remember where you were, and how you heard about Pearl Harbor and your reaction? Yes, very well. I walked out of the theater in Hamilton and everybody was saying, you heard the Japanese attack Pearl Harbor. And that's what I remember. And I remember uh, listening to Roosevelt's speech uh, in the study hall of the high school in Hamilton. Mm -hmm. How did you feel when you heard about this? Mm -hmm. Well, just like later on now, so we just like to get those Japanese and mm -hmm. get even with them and what they did to us. Did you know where Pearl Harbor was? Not really. Yeah, most, most uh, had an idea from mm -hmm. news re reports, you know, mm -hmm. and got a quick lesson in geography. Yes, okay. Um, did you enlist or were you drafted? <laughs> <laughs> Mike, you keep asking <laughs> crazy stories. They're not they're crazy. Uh, when I was 17, in the summer of, of, of 43, I uh, signed up with the Marines. And they said, we'll put you, uh, wait, we'll call you up and get your mother's signature and that'll be the, you know, so mm -hmm. then you will go to, to Paris Island. Well, I have me out to New London to the uh, uh, submarine base. My uncle was in the Navy and I was out there and I got a call to get home that the Marines had called me up. Got back, and the day I was to be sworn in the Marines, they said, uh, uh, how old are you? I says, 18. And they says, we can't take you now. You have to sign up for the draft. So on the way home from Syracuse, I signed up the draft, and I says, take me the next thing, because I'm supposed to be in the Marines. And I was called up in October of 43 and went in the Marines then. Okay. It's kind of, kind of difficult, isn't it? Yes, yes. Yeah. Um, why did you want to go into the Marine Corps? Well, uh, being that my uncle was a Navy man in the submarine service, I wanted to be in the Navy. Colgate University, where I lived practically on campus, was a V5, V7, and V12 programs for officer training. Mm -hmm. And one of the programs was Marine Corps officers training. And once the Marines got there, I wanted to be a Marine. <laughs> and I'm still happy I was. Okay. Uh, where did you go for your basic training? Uh, Paris Island. Okay. Could you tell us about your basic training a little bit? Well, <clears throat> there isn't too much to tell. It's the same as uh, any Marine who goes through basic training. You know, they get you in try to get you in shape and teach you all the military things. Uh, I was in good shape because I lived uh, a mile from the university and I used to run every morning 
uh, to work up on the hill at Colgate University. I worked in the Colgate Co-op. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, you know, in fact, I worked on the golf course. <laughs> and then I would run back home. So all summer long, I had to run that mile both directions, and that's what kept me in good shape. Mm -hmm. So, you know, these other guys are really had dog in it because they were tired and everything else. They weren't in shape. I was in good shape. And basically, uh, that was, you know, boot camp as it is practically today. Mm -hmm. How long were you at Paris Island? I went in October and I came out in a week before Christmas in uh, 43, December. Okay. About the 17th of December. All right, after, in December, where were you sent? Uh, I was had to report back to Norfolk, Virginia to C school. Being, C, uh, being a seagoing Marine. Mm -hmm. They got, got one little uh, paradox of that or side thing. When I came back somewhere, when we were assigned our new thing, I had about seven Marines or eight that were so happy because they were going to be born ships. And I said, oh, you going to Norfolk to sea school? No, he says, we're going to go to uh, North Carolina, train up Camp Lejeune. And I says, what are you in? Well, so we're in the Fleet Marines. So we're going to be aboard ship. And I said, you know what the Fleet Marines are? We're going aboard ship. I said, no. That means you're trained to make invasions. I'm a, I'm a seagoing Marine, and I'm the one that's going to be aboard ship. Well, you've never seen seven or eight guys so unhappy in your life, and they found out exactly where they were being sent. Now, what did you, what was it like going to sea school? What did they do there? Well, it was quite a bit different than, uh, you know, uh, basic training because we had to learn all about Navy lingo and uh, Navy, uh, what the Navy did, then what your jobs are going to be. Uh, mm -hmm. Basically, a Marine's job aboard ship is uh, like gangway watch, any aircraft, and then the Marines took care of the captains. They were called captain's orderlies. Mm -hmm. And then we were assigned a, a ship. Okay, now how long was your sea school? How long did that last? Uh, first week in January through uh, sometime in April. So it was longer than basic training, wasn't it? Pardon? Longer than basic training? Uh, about the same. About the same, about okay. The same. All right. Um, all right, where were you assigned after C school? Well, I was uh, assigned to a uh, troop transport, the, the USS General GM Randall, AP-115. Okay. This was a troop transport, and they carried between four and five thousand troops on every trip we made overseas. Now, what was your assignment on that ship? I was basically anti-aircraft and uh, guard duty. So, on a trip overseas, uh, we would have army guards come in, and we'd be in charge of a certain area of the ship and over the army guards. So, uh, this is part of my duties, and of course, general quarters was uh, the 20 millimeter anti aircraft guns. Mm -hmm. Now, so on your ship, then, as part of the crew, you had Navy, you had some Army men, and, and Marines. Okay, we'll back off a little oh, bit. Okay. The ship was a Coast Guard ship. Oh, believe it or not. this is a Coast Guard ship. And this ship uh, is uh, uh, two football, foots, football fields long, so it was a Quite a good size transport. Mm -hmm. uh, the uh, army people were like going overseas, and uh, a certain division of the army they make guards, oh, okay. and they would patrol their areas. Mm -hmm. And as I say, then the Marines were over had a certain area of the ship uh, we took care of and uh, helped the army guard if they needed any help. All right. Uh, could you tell us about when did you end up going out into the Pacific? Sometime in April, we went on a shakedown cruise, came back to Newport News, Virginia, and uh, loaded Army troops. Went through the canal, the uh, Panama mm -hmm. Canal, and uh, ended up in uh, Perth, Australia, and then uh, 
the Indian Ocean up to Bombay and unloaded the troops there and then picked up whatever there. And we, uh, one of the things I will remember that was kind of funny, we picked up Chinese airmen that were coming to the United States to train and uh, we hit, uh, I don't know, it's like our uh, hurricanes here, I forgot what they call it on the West Coast. Typhoons. Right? Uh, typhoon. Typhoon. We sort of hit a typhoon and uh, I didn't laugh. We had some green Chinamen on that trip because <laughs> they got awful sick in those rough seas. <laughs> So I, I remember that as one of the things that happened. Um, so, so these uh, Chinese were being brought to the United States as, as aviator yeah. trainers? They had a couple hundred or so Chinese mm -hmm. airmen that were going to be trained in our ways of fighting and, mm -hmm. and they're away from harm's way. I guess that's why they wanted to train them over the United States. Okay. Uh, what other voyages did you have? This was your first voyage, correct? One uh, of your first ones, or? I'm not sure which trip uh, we got the Chinese mm -hmm. on. How many trips did you make? Well, during my 23 months aboard ship, I hit 32 islands and countries. Wow. So it, it's, after 60 years, it's kind of hard to remember mm -hmm. which yes, trip yes. was which trip. Could you tell us about some of your your voyages that were maybe a little more memorable than others? Some of the things you remember. Uh, one of the things, Mike, that uh, you and I got to talk about, and uh, I'll show you. Well, a picture, oh yes. Show you it's a picture of this ship right now. This is our troop transport, and uh, one of the trips after the war, uh, we took back the Japanese diplomats to Germany that were captured over in, in Germany. And when they got aboard ship... Now, did you go to Germany to pick them up? Where no, did we pick picked them up in Marseille, France. Oh, okay. And, uh, no, we picked, them, we picked them up on the West Coast, excuse me. We picked them up on the West Coast and took them back to uh, Yokohama. We treated these diplomats with royalty. Uh, they were put up in officers' quarters. They, they ate officers' food. How many were there? Uh, I remember right, uh, between eight and ten. Mm -hmm. uh, but I remember getting to Japan and dropped anchor in Yokohama, in the harbor, off in Yokohama. And when the the Japanese came to pick up their diplomats. They had gone into the Pacific Ocean and dumped their garbage, come back and tied up at the gangplank, and these Japanese diplomats actually got inside the garbage scows and rode back to their country in Yokohama in garbage scows. <laughs> so just to show you. Also, on this same trip, we were the first ship to take Japanese Americans back to Japan because they believed that Japan won the war and it was all propaganda showing that we won the war and they wanted to give up their American citizenships to go back to Japan and live. I've never heard of that. You, where did you, from the western, west we coast? Took them from, I think we took them from somewhere in the west coast, probably uh, LA uh, or San Francisco, I don't remember which now. and. Uh, we took them back to Yokohama, so that we were the, actually the first ship to do that. And there was other troop transports later on that uh, took these, these uh, Japanese Americans. And also, the same trip, we took American soldiers that were going to do occupational duties in Japan. What were the relations like with these people that wanted to go back? Do you remember it all? Well, uh, I've got one little episode on the same trip where they were put all the Japanese uh, Americans up on decks so that they could take the hoses and uh, wash down the, the, the head, as we call it, in the Navy and Marines. 
and we're watching these down, and we had American soldiers on the gangways to keep them up there till they got the place all cleaned up and the water down the drained out of the bathrooms and areas cleaned up, and this one guy wanted to go to the bathroom. Well, evidently the soldier that was on duty must have been a combat soldier fighting against the Japanese, and he kept insisting he couldn't go down. And the guy who shoved the soldier soldier aside, and the guy took his carbine off his shoulder, whoa, right over this man's head. And it, the butt broke and it come back and hit the guy the second time and he ended up unconscious and when they took him off in the garbage scowl I was just telling you about, he was still unconscious. That was about three days later after this all happened. So they thought, well, we're Japanese, we could go through, you know, we got to go, you're going to let me. They wouldn't, didn't want to follow orders. So this guy found out different. Now you said at the end of the war or toward the end of the war about bringing Polish children? Uh, sometime one of the trips from Bombay, India, we had Polish orphans that we picked up at, at Bombay. Now how did they get there? You, I you know, have or? no idea. Hmm. Uh, whether they flew them in to uh, Bombay or whether they went, came through the Red Sea and, and over to Bombay, I don't know. And. Uh, we took them back to be adopted in Melbourne. The Australians were adopting, I would say it was a hundred or more of these orphans. And to make this, the reason I'm bringing this up, because I believe it's 45 years later, one of the orphans met our ship and uh, our AP Transport Association and uh, was our guest speaker. I was quite interested to have one of our orphans end up talking to us. Uh, well, the uh, Marines, Coast Guard, and Navy all, all there at a the, uh, meeting. How many of the orphans were there? I would say over a hundred. Hmm. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. Do you have any other stories you wanted to tell us? Uh, I have dozens of them, but two. None of them were combat related. Well, but uh, one of our trips to Bombay, uh, we were going, and uh, at noon of that day, we passed a merchant vessel. And never thought a thing about it. And that night, when they called my gun tub and said, saying, I, I, we, we, sir. I said, aye, aye, sir. I said, we, oui, we, oui, and I got chewed out. And he says, I don't know if you knew it, but we passed a merchant ship at noon, and at 6 o'clock we picked up an SOS because there was a submarine trying to catch us. And they took the merchant ship, and having about 5,000 troops, we did not go back to help those poor souls out because we couldn't, for uh, 25, 30 men, we couldn't sacrifice 5,000 American troops, so we just had to keep right on going. Mm -hmm. Were you ever under attack from a submarine or from a Japanese airplane? Or? Uh, the submarine could not catch us, mm -hmm. even if it was on the surface, and we were doing flank speed, which is about 24 or 25 knots, mm -hmm. and they couldn't catch us. Did you travel in convoys or a single ship? <laughs> uh, both. Mm -hmm. uh, never in a big convoy. Uh, we pulled out of, basically out of Melbourne and they would uh, send some naval ships with us. And once we got in the middle of uh, the Indian Ocean, they'd turn around and head back or wherever they were going. Now, were most of your voyages to Australia and India? That was our first three trips we mm -hmm. made there, and then from there on we made trips throughout the islands and then went over to the Philippines. Uh, one of the things that was memorable to me was when we were in the Caroline Islands. Uh, in fact, we were there when World War II ended, and this is a friend of mine from Hamilton was in the Navy and we were receiving ship in, in Base X or the Caroline Islands. And we met. And the first time he saw me was General 
Florence. A Japanese plane was heading for the Caroline Islands, and my uh, gunner was on an island called Mogmog in the Carolines, and that was a recreational facilities, mm -hmm. and that meant I was gunner. So when I was eating chow in the general quarters rang, and I headed to the thing and then this gangway, a passageway in the ship, when his coast guard and heading for his step battle station slipped. And I remember jumping up in the midair and he rolled, tumbled underneath me as I jumped in the air. And this fellow right here, Spence Ripley from Hamilton, was looking out the porthole and he recognized me. <laughs> and then uh, he was so surprised. Uh, but anyway, I got up to my gun well, opened the ammunition carrier, it was 105 degrees inside there, and uh, got strapped myself in and waiting for that chap plane to come in, and I was hoping he'd come in, and because I had one thought in mind, that Japanese plane is going to be a flight of ducks, and you always lead ducks, so remember, you've got to lead those ducks. Well, the Navy was did injustice to me. They shot the plane 17 <laughs> miles out, and I never got the shot, the fire shot at the enemy. Okay, how about the uh, the food on the ship? Did you eat pretty well, or? Well, we ate. Uh, uh, regular chow with the crew would eat like that, and, but I ate a little bit better because I uh, when I we go up to the officer's galley and had friends up there, and uh, I would have a steak once in a while and things like that, and so I was pretty lucky. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had 40 Marines over a yeah. period of time aboard this ship, and Lieutenant Leland, who retired after 30 years as a full colonel, uh, he was a lieutenant at the time, and. Uh, we got the reputation of being Lieutenant Leland and his 40 thieves. <laughs> <laughs> so, I don't know, they always come up with different things like that, but basically food from the officers' quarters and things like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, what was daily life like on the ship? Did you, how did you entertain yourself when you were off duty? Well, I could throw in a curve at me here. Uh, <laughs> Well, both, a lot of us did a lot of reading, and mm -hmm. we wandered around and uh, watched the ocean. <laughs> and, uh, did you get movies on board at all? Or? Uh, I think at night they had movies out on deck, if I mm -hmm. remember right. Mm -hmm. Now, where were you when you heard about the death of President Roosevelt? Do you recall that at all? Yeah, very well. It, we got the news forecast, and uh, of course we all felt bad that our president had died and that. Yeah. We got a little fun out of it. The Marine Corps bugler, who hadn't played a bugle in two years, was in our detachment aboard ship, mm -hmm. and they insisted he blow a bugle. And he says, my lips are soft. He says, I'll, I'll have trouble blowing that bugle. He says, I can't really do it. And blow it taps mm -hmm. correctly. Well, they insisted, and he hit a few bad notes like that. And so he got the nickname as the Note. <laughs> well, somewhere out in the Pacific, there's a brass bugle laying on the bottom. Because <laughs> that night, he tossed it overboard. Do you remember where you were when you heard about the uh, dropping the atomic bombs? Uh, I can give you more information. Uh, when the war ended over in Europe, okay. uh, we were at this island, the uh, Caroline Islands, Base X. Mm -hmm. And that's where we were there. And this friend of mine that I just showed you a picture of, him and I celebrated by having a cocktail fruit cocktail <laughs> out of the officer's mess because he worked in the officer's mess mm -hmm. until he got transferred back to his ship because he was in a hospital ship. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was war in Europe and then I think we were in the South Pacific again when we heard about the atomic bomb and the mm -hmm. war was over, or mm -hmm. atomic bombs. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, now you told us you were able to sneak a camera on board? Shh, it's illegal. <laughs> 
Yeah, I, uh, we were at, uh, back at Norfolk and I had a seven day leave. And when I came back, I put my camera in the middle of my duffel bag and surrounded it with clothes and uh, actually the Marines fell inside for bottles of whiskey and I didn't drink at the time. Mm -hmm. And uh, I said, you won't find any bottles or anything in bottles of whiskey or anything in there. And he said, oh, we just want to make sure. And I'm sweating it out because I had this camera aboard. Now, how were you able to get film for it? Uh, when we hit port. Okay. And, and then how did you have it developed? Uh, when we hit port, I would okay. go to a photography thing. And sometimes I'd have them sent home. Mm -hmm. And uh, one time uh, in San Francisco, uh, I got called up the officer's mask, which is a small, like a court, traffic court with the military. It seems as if that we come off from uh, Liberty two days before, and the fog was so thick that they said, come back in another hour, and if it's fog list, we'd take you back to your ship, which was anchored uh, somewhere in San Francisco Bay. So that day, we got back with a bunch of the Coast Guard guys, and I said, oh, I said, I forgot to pick my film up. As long as it's this foggy, we won't be going back to the ship until this fog lifts. Well, the time we got the film and got back there, our Liberty ships had left for the boat, things like that, and uh, I think it was three of those or four of those that were with me, were five of us who were up for the captain's mask. So I saw where it started, so I said to the guys, Keep on my left. So I said, okay. So when the captain got up there and asked me why I missed the livery boat, so I told him I don't exactly why I missed it. And I said, these five guys went with me. I'm the fault of those guys being late like that. So I got restricted to five days of liberty, and the other guys got off scot free because it was my fault. Mm -hmm. And I, it was terrible. I lost the liberty. I'm, uh, Caroline Islands on Mogmog Island, that's where my five day liberty would have been on Mogmog. And another interesting part, uh, one of the Coast Guard's pharmacies, so on our reunions uh, after the war, way after, long after the war, uh, he sort of joined the Marines in a, in a sense, because whatever we did, he did. And one of our Reunions was in the Pocono Mountains, just the Marines, not the ship. And he showed up. And during dinner that night, he reaches down, he pulls a Coke bottle out. Remember the guy's Coke bottles? Mm -hmm. Half full of sand, and give them to the Marine, Tom Travers, who started the first Marine, uh, first reunion we ever had together. After 37 years, he handed Tom Travers this bottle and he says, Here. Well, I went down to visit Mog Mog to see if it changed any. He, he says, Well, walking around, I found this Coke bottle and put sand in it. Here's the here's Coke bottle from Mog Mog and the sand. <laughs> <laughs> now, when were you discharged? March 31st, 1946. Okay. Um, when you returned home, did you make, I think you alluded to this, you made use of the GI Bill? Uh, well, when I first got home, I went back to high school. Yes, yeah, you said that. And then uh, after that, I worked two years at a photography studio in Hamilton. And then uh, I went to, I call it USC, which is Utica School of Commerce. And it took up two years of business. Mm -hmm. Okay. Did you make use of the uh, 5220 Club at all? What is the 52? It was uh, like an unemployment insurance. 52, for 52 weeks, you received twenty dollars a week from the government. I don't believe so. Okay. I'm not sure. Um, have you joined any veterans organizations? <laughs> I've been in the American Legion for 60 years. On my Legion cap that I got a couple of months, well, four months ago. For every five years, you get a star, and I got 12 stars on that cap. And there's only two of us in our legion in Risky Falls that got 12 stars. Hmm. There might be three of us, and I'm not sure. But anyway, I belong to the uh, Marine Corps League. Mm -hmm. I've been a member for over 10 years. I'm a 
historian. Uh, in fact, uh, this is our jacket and with the insignia, and then I've got my back. I don't know if you want to see that. But, sure. Well, look. How clear it is. Yeah, but it's very clear. We can okay. Got it? Yep, got it. Okay. Uh, we're known as the Emerald City Detachment. Now, the Emerald City is, you remember the story, The Wizard of Oz? Oz okay. Is in Chit the, the, the author, Frank Baum, lived, uh, was born in Chittango, and the Chittango native, so he moved to Kansas. And that's, uh, that's why these green jackets are the emeralds. That's why we're called the Emerald City. And we're the only Marine Corps League detachment in New York State that are allowed to wear this green jacket. The rest of them have to wear red jackets. So we got okay, now you also mentioned you've been to reunions. Oh yeah, we've been going to a lot of reunions. I'd like to go back. Sure. To the Marine Corps League. I'm, I think I mentioned I was a historian. I yes. think that. But anyway, I do toys for tots in southern Madison County. Mm -hmm. uh, my wife came up with an idea that maybe Colgate University would uh, have a toys for tots hockey game. So I worked with the assistant athletic director and told him what we wanted to do. And he thought it was a great idea. Why don't we do it at a Colgate football game? Right. So he says, we get more people there, mm -hmm. and I said, good, I want to do, and he cut in and says, what we'll do is have them, they bring a toy, they get in the game free. And I said, how about a donation? If they didn't happen to bring a toy, he says, they still get in free. So I get a notion. So this year is our third annual Toys for Tots game on November 12th, uh, Colgate Bucknell game. And uh, we hope we did as good as last year, which we took in over, uh, well, over $1,700 plus over five bags of toys. So it's a good fundraiser. So that's what I do with the Marine Corps League, one of my pet projects. Was there any members of the crew or any other people that you stayed in contact with after the war? Well, until we had our uh, first reunion after 37 years, uh, we have a nucleus that started about 11 members out of 40, and there's probably less than 15 of us still alive, and I'm the healthiest one of the bunch. Mm -hmm. uh, we keep together. Uh, I just had my 80th birthday party. And my wife and my daughter-in-law put letters out, and uh, they were hoping I'd get 80 birthday cards, and I think I was five short. <laughs> but at least six of them, including my commanding officer, uh, sent me birthday cards, and some of them with messages in them and things like that. Hmm. But uh, we've got telephone numbers, and uh, mm -hmm. there's at least six of us that talk back and forth ever so often. Mm -hmm. So we kept contact. How do you think your time in the service changed or affected your life? I'm not exactly sure, you know. It's, mm -hmm. uh, learned a little bit of discipline and things like that. But uh, until I joined the Marine Corps League and got active in the Marines there, uh, up until that point, uh, uh, it didn't affect it hardly at all. Mm -hmm. I was just proud to be a Marine and glad I how do you feel going back? You were in high school, you were what, about 20 years old? I was just 20 when I went back. How did it feel being back in high school at 20 well, after being in the Marine Corps for three years? It was a little bit difficult and uh, during the, the gym period I had ended up with uh, six and seven graders. <laughs> and I thought maybe they'd put me in a helping capacity. No, nope. they put me in there, we're doing the same thing as kids. Well, they got into a touch football game, but, oh, probably a month after I was thing, and uh, I slid, just as I started down, one of the littlest kids was right underneath me. Luckily, I was able to throw my body to one side and miss this kid, because I would have broke bones in this poor little kid. And I got up, 
And I went over to the teacher and I said, don't expect me back. And I said, I don't want to hurt these little kids. I'm too big to be playing football and things with kids this young. So they called me up the office and said, if you don't take uh, your gymnasium and keep in shape, he said, you're not going to graduate. And I says, wait a minute, I spent three and a half years keeping in shape and training and everything else. I think that ought to cover my one or two days a week mm -hmm. in the gym class. And I didn't want to hurt one of those kids, and I prayed that something happened that it could happen. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you very much for your interview. Okay, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. I hope I gave you enough information. Yes, you did.